this is what those storage abstractions look like back in Multics. In order to do disk I.O. in Multics, this is the kind of thing you had to do. You had to attach a switch, and there were various different ways you could do that. If you wanted to do things like write to a file, this is already 1980. Your Multics was around starting in the 1960s. But even by 1980, the way that you had to write to a disk, you had to understand lots of things about how disks were organized. You didn't have anything like the real simple open a file and write to it abstractions that we have today. What are the abstractions that we should have in a modern system for storage? What are, actually, I should ask, what are the ones that we do have? Before we think about the ones we should have. Yes. So that's good. So that's actually, we think of having things organized in files. We're going to talk a lot more about file systems the rest of the class, and you're implementing file system for Palm Set 4. So that's one kind of storage abstraction, and that's one of the main ones. The other one is memory locations. Right? Files are also a kind of memory location. But when you're writing code, you've got abstraction to storage. That storage could be stored in DRAM. It could be in a register. It could be on a disk. At the level of writing a Rust program or a C program or a Java program, you don't know the difference. You have an abstraction that's giving you access to that storage. And the operating system is doing a lot of what provides that by maintaining the page tables and giving you virtual addresses. Does it make sense to have those two? Are those things really different? What's really different about files and memory abstractions when you write programs today? Right, both of them have the property that we can read and write. That's what storage is giving us. We can write some value. We have some way to refer to that location that we wrote it and get the same value back. Is there a reason we need both memory and files for this? I would sort of argue that there really shouldn't be a difference. This is more of a historical artifact. The big difference there is now is persistence. We think of a file as something that's going to last forever, at least until someone deletes it or we destroy our disk drive, whereas we think of the memory in the program as something that's very transient, that when that process finishes executing is no longer there. That's pretty ingrained in how we use computers today. I think it's probably bad. So I'm going to call this a bad distinction that we have those two abstractions that are, are really for the same thing. Persistence should be orthogonal to the abstractions we use to refer to things, although that certainly would be a big change in computer systems to change that. The other thing we have are things like databases and URLs, and those are also ways to reference locations and store things. Those are viewed maybe as higher level abstractions that might be implemented on top of files. It's a, another question that if you're really thinking about are our computing systems today doing the right thing, why those things should really be different, and whether what we really should have is some persistent data store and some transient data store and ways of referring to them that can be whatever is the most convenient abstraction for referring to things and not this file memory distinction that we have. But that's what we have. What we're going to do next is look at this file abstraction that is provided by Unix and the descendants of Unix. And it's a pretty powerful abstraction. So which of these things are files in Unix? We've got the PowerPoint that I'm using for this class. We've got a disk drive. We've got a directory. We've got random numbers. We've got the list of current interrupts. We've got a terminal session. Which of those are files? Right, go ahead. Good. All of them are. These things don't seem like files to people that aren't sophisticated computer systems people like yourselves. They would probably say, well, maybe one of those is a file, the PowerPoint file. In Unix, all of these are files. So it is a very powerful abstraction. All of these things are just files. You can go to dev random. That's going to give you the list of random numbers. Terminal is dev tty something. The interesting one, if you're running most Linux versions other than so Mac OS does not give you this nice file view of processes. But Ubuntu does, and Unix traditionally has. So if you go to the proc directory, you can see all sorts of things about the processes running. This is just treated like a regular file. You can interact with it with your program in any way. So one of the files there is interrupts. That is a file that tells you the current state of the interrupts. So if a program sets up a new interrupt handler, this file would change. But you can interact with this just like a regular file. You can't write to it, at least not as a user level program. And if you could, that would probably cause strange things to happen. 
But you can see all the interrupts that are set up, and you can see they're by, so we have eight cores here, and whatever happens to be running now in each core, in this file we can see all the interrupts. Many of them are zero, that means there's no handler. So these are interrupts for things like a seg fault, and there's no handler set up for that process that's currently running on that core to deal with it. And some of them do have handlers, and you can see the numbers there, and we'd have to look a lot more closely at that to figure out what that interrupt is and what the handler is for. Can you figure out what are all these numbers here? So these are also files? Yes. Each of these is actually a process. So all the processes that are running, within these we'll see the file descriptors. So you're on the right track that their file descriptor is visible through this proc directory. And let's see. So my shell is PID 7495. Within that directory, there are files and subdirectories that have all the information about what's going on in this process. So if you want to explore processes that are running, the fact that this is just a nice file abstraction in, in Linux is really convenient. And the file descriptors are in that FD directory. So we have, it looks like, actually, yeah. They're symbolic links to the files. We can see the one that I looked at is pointing to dev null, which doesn't have anything. The one that's 15 is some file that now we're looking at whatever happens to be in that file which looks like nothing now. And given that this is a shell, not doing anything interesting with files, it's a little odd that there are five descriptors all pointing to the same thing. You'd have to look more at what Bash is doing, why it has those five file descriptors pointing to the same thing. You should have some fun exploring proc and realizing that you're just looking at files, but they're giving you a lot of insight into the state of what's running on the current machine and what the operating system is doing. The way those files are represented, and this is true for all files, we're going to look specifically at Unix System 5, which was a very early version of Unix. Pretty much all descendants have something similar to this. So there's an inode, and inode is what represents the file, and it's got information about how big the file is, things about its permissions, and then it's got the disk map. The disk map is telling you where the actual data of the file is stored. We can look at the code in the kernel and see how that's actually implemented. There's a struct for an inode, and it's got things that correspond to that, and it's got pointers that give you the disk map. We'll talk more about what that is soon. And it's got a count of the number of open references to it. So it's not that simple. I've cut out some parts of it. It's the whole description of the struct with all the comments and stuff is close to 100 lines. But this is what's in the Linux kernel is used to represent that inode that is used to represent the file. You can see information about that using stat. So if you stat with the dash x and give it a file name, you can actually see the inode that's there. You can see other information about what's stored in that inode. These are the permission bits. The read-write means it's readable and writable to me and readable to anyone else. And we'll talk more about access controls in a later class. We can do things like create a link. So ln is creating a link to that file, so we're going to have a new name, but it's pointing to the same data. You can see now that the number of links to this inode has increased, so now it's two. If we look at the one we created with this link, we can see the inode's the same. So we have two names now, but the data structure that represents that file is the same. They're just two different names that refer to the same data structure, and they both have two links because they're two names that refer to it. I can delete the file name. I should be careful about deleting my slides for class. Hopefully I know what I'm doing. And now, when I do stat, well, the file doesn't exist. What do you think is going to happen when I do stat on the link that I made, the today's class.pptx file? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So the, that file still exists. But I didn't delete it. All RM does is removes the name of that file from the directory. So if we look at stat on the link file, so this was before. It had two links, this inode. We did the RM. And now we're looking at stat again on it. The inode's the same. And the number of links has gone down by one. PowerPoint gets kind of confused when you do stuff like this. But otherwise, you haven't done anything that affected the actual data in that file. You just remove one of the names that refers to that inode that has the data that you need. So what's actually in the disk map? So what the inode is is this. The important part of it is, well, the, all of it's important. But the disk map is what tells you where the actual contents of the file are. That has pointers to blocks on the disk. The way inodes are in Unix System 5 is 
This is a fixed size. I know it is a fixed size struct. We had room for 13 entries here. Each one is 32 bits. The disk map is a fixed size. We have space for 13 pointers, each of which can point to a disk block. So what's the biggest file I can store? So I have room in my disk map for 13 pointers. Each one points to a disk block, which is one kilobyte. How big is the biggest file with this structure? Yeah, it would be 13 kilobytes. So even back in Unix system five days, that was not good enough. 13 kilobytes is pretty small. Can't even store our, our little logo image in that anymore. So what do you do to get more storage out of this? To be able to have bigger files? So you could expand the disk map. You can make that bigger, but it makes things a lot less complex if the inode is a fixed size. If you make it bigger, you're going to be wasting storage for every file that's smaller than 13 kilobytes, which is a lot of files, especially in older days when people were less wasteful of space than we are now and had less videos and images around. So what do you do instead? Good, yeah. So what we want to do is instead of having all of these point to just one kilobyte blocks, we're going to allow some of them to point to blocks that can be new disk maps. That is what they did. The first 10 point to one kilobyte blocks, and those are interpreted very simply. The next one points to what they call an indirect disk block, which is still the same size. All the physical blocks on the disk are treated as one kilobyte. But instead of that being contents of the file, that is a collection of pointers to disk blocks. So now we can have more storage. Each pointer we need four bytes for. We're using 32 bits to address location on the disk. That means with our indirect block, we can have 256 pointers, each one giving us one kilobyte. So now we've got enough space for, well, the original space was 13. Now we've got space for, this is 10K plus 256K that we can access indirectly. What would it make sense to do with the 12th slot? Should that point to another indirect disk block like this or something else? Yes. If the file is done, so these things can just be zeros, which would mean there's no more of the file. So we can end the file wherever we need. But if we want to store bigger files, well, we can get another 256 kilobytes by having another indirect block. If we want to get bigger files, well, we can have a super block. So what we're going to have instead is a double indirect here, where each entry here, instead of pointing to a regular disk block, is now going to point to another indirect disk block which now has space for 256 pointers to 1K disk blocks. So now we're getting 256 times these. Each of those is 256 pointers to a 1K page. So now we're getting reasonable size files. We can carry that out again. So you could have the next slot have a triple indirect disk block. If you wanted to figure out if your OS has a file structure like this. So suppose you're writing a user level program and you want to figure out what the structure of the file system is like. Are there tests that you could do to figure out if you have this structure? OK, good. So there's really some maximum size file you can start with this. You could figure out a lot by just creating a file and see what the biggest file you could create. But it might be that the size of your disk is actually not big enough to hold the biggest file you could create with this. And once you've got the triple indirect blocks, if that's, that's what the 12 slot points to, then you're getting to file sizes that, at least with the size disk that you likely had, in the 1970s when you were running Unix System 5, probably it's big enough to access the whole disk. So suppose you can't max out the file size. Are there other tests you could do to figure out if you have this kind of file system? And let's assume it's a user level program, but you do have access to a clock. So you can time how long it takes to do things. Are there timing tests you could do that would reveal or at least give you a good evidence that you have this kind of file system? Good. Yeah. So the time to read and write is going to be different depending on where you're reading and writing in the file. So reading and writing to the first 10K, that's going to be really fast. Well, it's not going to be really fast. You're still going to the disk. It's going to depend a lot on what's cached in memory. But at least you only have to go to the disk once. The first time you read and write to anything past the first 10K, well, you've got to go to the disk twice. You've got to go to the disk to read this block. And then that's going to tell you where to go to the disk to read another block. So that's going to take about twice as long as the first read or write to data in the first 10K of the file. Once you get past the 256, well, 260K or so, then it's going to take three times as long. 
you could, with timing experience, get a lot of evidence that would confirm that your file system has this structure. And this is kind of an undesirable property of a file system, for it to take longer to read data as you go later in the file. There's nothing really special about directories. It's just a file where the contents of that file are a list of file names and the inode where they're stored. So that's what we were seeing when we did the stat. When we did the RM and removed the file, it removed it from this list. It didn't necessarily remove what the inode points to. That's why we have this links counter to know whether there are other ways of referencing it. This is very much like reference counting in memory to know when you can reclaim an inode. It doesn't do anything to overwrite those values on the disk. They're still there until something else overwrites them. But they could be reclaimed. You can see the whole tree, everything that's stored on the disk. This is just reading files and looking at the inodes. And you can see that map. And you get some sense the inode numbers tend to be allocated in order. The more recent ones have higher numbers than the earlier ones. Doing that for a big file system takes many hours. So I would be a little wary of starting this inodes at the root level because it's looking at everything on the disk. Let's stick with this model of the file system, what Unix System 5 is doing. What are all the things that we need to do to create a new file? First thing we should answer, where are these happening? So who has to think about all the things that you need to do to create a new file? When you write a high-level program, what do you do to create a new file? Let's say you're writing Rust when you still had it without taking out all the standard library, or Java, or Python, or any programming language. How do you create a file? Yes. Very simple, right? You're calling some function like fopen, passing in a file name, and passing in you know, write to create a new file for writing. Magically, that file now exists. So what do you think fopen is actually doing? Once you have the, the no st std directive that gets rid of the standard library, do you think you can use any of these file operations? Yeah, definitely not. That's why you have to implement a file system. And the part of the file system that needs to create a new file, well, when fopen is called, it's going to make some system call that will create a new file. What that needs to do is set up that structure. We will continue with this next class.